Okay, I think we have quite a crowd tonight. I think it's six o'clock. So um, can everyone thumbs up if you can hear me okay out there? Great. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. It's really nice. We have such a good crowd tonight. Um, this is the first time we've done a virtual book release event for the Gallatin History Museum. So we're excited to see how this goes and we might end up doing some more in the future. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel Phillips. I'm the research coordinator at the Gallatin History Museum. And for those of you unfamiliar with the Museum and Historical Society, um, the Gallatin Historical Society is a nonprofit whose mission is to preserve, promote, and foster the history of Gallatin County in Southwest Montana. The society operates a museum located in the old county jail building in Bozeman. And we also run a very active research library and publish a quarterly local history magazine called um, the Gallatin History Quarterly. And I, at this point, I'm going to put up a um, slide of some contact information um, in case you wish to reach out to us for any reason about um, tonight's event or um, questions about purchasing a book or anything like that, feel free to re reach out to me by phone or email there. Um, if you haven't ordered a copy already, we do have copies of Mark's new book, Side Saddles and Geysers, available in our museum bookstore. And Mark will be very happy to sign or inscribe a copy for you. We can mail books to you, or if you live in the area and would rather pick it up at our museum bookstore, that works great as well. Um, if you want to order via phone or email, feel free to give me a call or send me a note, or you can go online to our um, museum bookstore page, gallatinhistorymuseum.org slash bookstore and gifts. Uh, very shortly here, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark for his presentation. And after he's done, we're hoping to have a few minutes left for a question or two. And until then, just a quick reminder, if everyone can keep their microphones on mute so that um, Mark's image can stay up so we can all see him, that would be great. And with that, I would like to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, we are so pleased to have Mark Miller with us. Um, he has been a volunteer at the Gallatin History Museum for about 17 years, and he enjoys assisting researchers in our library, um, is a frequent contributor to our quarterly magazine, and even occasionally helps out um, at our front desk and getting folks started on tours in the museum. He is the author of five books that relate to stories of early visitors to Yellowstone Park and is a fifth generation Montanan who grew up on a cattle ranch in Southwest Montana about five or 90 miles from Yellowstone Park. His interest in Yellowstone history began when he was a small boy listening to his grandmother's tales of her trip to the park in 1909 and then her father and grandfather's trip there in 1882. So with that, I will turn it over to Mark Miller. Thank you, Rachel. It's great to see some familiar faces there. Um, I'm not seeing everybody, but I'm seeing a lot of folks that I know. And I would like to tell you about my latest book, Side Saddles and Geysers. Um, it's a book that I've wanted to put together for a long time. It is a, an anthology, a collection of other people's writing. Um, it's 10 stories by women who visited the park in its first 30 years. That is between uh, 1872 and 1903 are, are the dates on the stories. Um, it's a wonderful collection. When I was um, putting my last book to bed, Encounters in Yellowstone, I was refiling. I, I worked kind of frantically to get Encounters in Yellowstone done uh, and my files were in disarray. And that's when I noticed that I finally had enough good stories by women to put together a book. Uh, I have about 40 stories by women in my collection. 
and I chose the best 10 of those. I chose them to be well-written. I chose them to represent a variety of, ex of experiences in the park and a variety of kinds of people who visited the park. Uh, so we get, we get a lot of variety in this set of stories. Um, they've got some raucous humor and uh, some high adventure in them. What I'd like to do tonight is tell you a little bit about these, put the stories in context and share some snippets with you. Uh, so I'll be with you in a second. Let's begin at the beginning. Um, Yellowstone Park was established in 1872 by Act of Congress. And beginning that summer, uh, women began visiting the park. Um, I can't find any accounts by women who went to, the, went to the park before 1872. Of course, Native Americans were in the park for, oh, 10,000 years or so uh, before this, but uh, Euro-Americans, uh, women, 1872. The first woman to take a full tour of the park was a woman from Bozeman named Emma Stone. Um, other women had visited the park, uh, gone in from the, from the north as far as Mammoth Hot Springs or in from the west to the lower Geyser Basin. Uh, there weren't any roads to bring you further than that. So that's as far as a lot of them went. But Emma Stone, when she got to Mammoth uh, with her family, her husband and two teenage sons, um, they hired a guide and Emma rode across the park. So she saw the canyon, the falls, the lake, the upper and lower geyser basins. So she had a pretty full tour of the park. Uh, we don't know much more about Emma Stone's tour of the park. Uh, but she's credited with being the, the first woman for a quote, full tour of the park. Um, the oldest story I have of the park dates, in, it dates to 1874, a couple of years later. And I'd like to give you some snippets from one of those. Um, I've chosen a story by, by um, Mabel Cross Osmond. Uh, she was Mabel Cross the summer she went to the park in 1874, and she was just six years old. So she was probably the first um, Anglo child to visit, visit the park at six years old. Uh, unless you count Emma Stone's teenage children, and let's not do that. We, we'll give, um, give Mabel credit for being the first child to cross the park. Her father was the uh, was an agent at uh, Crow Agency. He worked he worked there. He had visited the park and wanted to take his family through the park before he returned back east. So he um, he did so. Um, he arranged an army escort to get the get the uh, the party well into the Paradise Valley, uh, then on into the park. Um, and then, um, well, let me, well, he, <coughs> I'm sorry, um, Mabel credited the horse she rode with saving her life. Her father had a blacksmith modify a man's saddle for her, and she said she sat, sat like a child in a, in a high chair on this horse as they were heading up the up, up the mountains one day um well I'll, I'll tell you what let me find what she said um dolly saved my life by instantly stopping while descending a steep trail my saddle turned leaving me high, high, hanging head downward helplessly strapped until others could reach me um, I suppose that would be a memorable event. That you, you would be with that. Uh, Mabel does a good job of, of uh, describing what it was like to, to travel and to camp. Um, 
she says it. Uh, and I'd like to read you that so you get a sense of what it was like to travel in Yellowstone Park in 1874. We could not travel far each day as my mother was not strong and unfortunately had a riding horse, not the one selected for her, as it had not come off the range in the last roundup. After a day's ride, when a camping place had been decided upon, a buffalo ro robe was quickly unpacked and my father would lift her down onto it. There she would rest while we all got busy. The horses were unsaddled and the pack mules relieved of their burden so they could all be picketed. The cook, having started his campfire, under undid the packs, set up the oven, and prepared the bread for baking, and then attended to the fish or game or the rest of the dinner. Fish were so plentiful, and fish were so plentiful that in the small streams, men could straddle from side to side and leaning down, pick them up with their hands. In the meantime, two tents had been set up and robes spread out for our beds. My first duty was to pick pick up and feed Molly a handful of grain of the long grass growing abundantly, as she always expected this feast. The days were warm and lovely and the nights were cold, so cold that of mornings the water in the tin wash bands wash pans would be frozen from the time one of us would use it until the next. So some things haven't changed in Yellowstone Park. It still gets cold overnight. Um, but that's um, Mabel Cross Osmond's story of, of making camp. Uh, they ride on horses all day, then fight, pick up a camp spot, and this is what happens. Um, The park changed very rapidly in those early years. The next story I'd like to read you is by a woman named Georgina Singe, who went to the park in 1889. By that time, the park was uh, pretty well developed. There were roads, there were hotels, there were a whole set of things. But Georgina uh, didn't want to go that way. Uh, she didn't like the restrictions of the guided tours she wanted to do her own thing and break the rules now and then. Uh, Georgina is a delightful writer. She liked, um, she observed um, and wrote about the people she met. She met prospectors, she met trappers. Uh, she was amused by Americans. Uh, Georgina was, was British. Uh, so that, there was that. Um, she loved fishing. She was a, she was an angler. Uh, and one time she decided to sneak out and drop soap down the beehive geyser to make it play. Uh, I should let you know that uh, that doesn't work, although uh, she claims it does. So let me read uh, Georgina's story. Uh, Rachel's smiling. She's read this story, so she knows what's coming. Um, here we go. Now there is a certain method for achieving, no, start over. There is a certain method for inducing a geyser to play out of its accustomed hours. This is done by, by what is called soaping. It may sound incredible, but it is a well-known fact that a bar or two of common yellow soap cut into pieces and slipped into a geyser cone will have it will have the direct effect in a very short interval. We were keen that the beehive should play, so we sallied forth after the world had gone to bed, armed with two large bars of brown Windsor tied up in a handkerchief. The moon was shining fit fitfully behind the clouds. Now and then it gleamed forth upon us as we climbed up the white sloping sides of the beehive. It was not due to play for several days. As, and as we peered down the dark funnel-like orifice, we could hear a soft, peaceful gurgling. And even this, 
This ceased after we dropped soap in. Then we sat down and watched. Presently, it began to bubble up little by little with a buzzing sort of noise. At last, alas, although it seemed to be trying with all its might, it never quite got off. We got quite desperate at last. It was nearly 12 o'clock and very cold. And, and a sharp, sharp frost had set in. We thought, however, we would give it one more try. We hurried back to camp. There we found our guide stretched out fast asleep before, smoling, before the smoldering embers, embers of the fire. We'll leave him there for a minute. For some reason, my mouth is really drying out tonight. Okay, we had we had the um, guide snoozing by the fire. We cruelly awoke him and made him bruise the last piece of yellow bar which we had hereto, hitherto thought necessary for washing. But no, even this last sacrifice was to no avail. The beehive would not play. We decided we could not freeze all night, even to see the beehive display. So dejectedly, dejectedly we made our way back to camp. The next morning, however, just as we were dressed, we heard a roar like the sound of a sudden hurricane or distant guns. Off we dashed, helter-skelter, arriving breathless, but just in time to see a grand eruption. It was terrific. It seemed the whole hillside must be blown out by the tremendous forth, force with which it burst. Higher and higher soared one great round of perpendicular column over 200 feet, clouding the whole sky with masses of spray and steam. It played for about 20 minutes, then wavered, trembled, and finally subsided with sundry gurgles and groans. As we came back, several people who had hurried from their beds to see the sight were making remarks about the curious fact that the beehive was playing before its time. That's been soaked, said a man who, who belonged to the place, looking suspiciously around, at which we appeared innocently surprised. I hope that gives you a flavor for Georgiana Singe's writing. Uh, really fun stuff, her descriptions of people and places. Um, and that's not the only time that she bent the rules. Uh, now I will repeat for you that this is, you know, against the regulations that doesn't work. Um, it also doesn't work to cook chickens uh, in hot springs as those of you who have been following the news recently will recall that um, uh, two men were uh, forbidden from it coming back to the park because they, they were caught trying to cook chickens in, in a hot spring. Uh, next, I'd like to tell you about Alice Richards. In contrast to Georgina Singe, Alice Richards did want to take a hotel tour. Alice Richards was the daughter of Wyoming's governor, and uh, she got invited to, to tour the park by the head of the Yellowstone Transportation Company. That meant that she got to tour the park in a comfortable coach and spend her nights in the park's new hotels. That was 1898, and by then, the park hotels rivaled the best in the nation. So this was a deluxe tour that Alice took. Her immediate problem was to, was to get companions to go to the park, and she didn't have any trouble finding three other young women to go with her, uh, but she did have trouble finding a chaperone and just didn't quite know what to do, and then finally just decided to go ahead and go without a chaperone, even though that wasn't really acceptable at the time. Uh, and she and her companions de decided to go on their absolute best behavior because they didn't want all those people from the East thinking that Western girls were uncultured. So uh, they traveled to the park. Alice does a good job of, of describing um, 
what it was like to stay in the hotels, to do things like that. Most writers miss that kind of thing. They're all too busy looking at geysers and canyons and waterfalls um, to really talk much about it. And the other thing that Alice, as a young woman, was really interested in was the young men. So let me read a, what, a little bit of uh, Alice's reminiscence about her trip to the park. We must have had a change of clothes for the evening, but I don't remember what we had. One young man whom we, whom we met said, why weren't we told that there would be parties in the evenings? Here you girls are all dressed up and I have only knickers. Maybe there should be a word about the members of the male sex whom we met on the trip. Mr. and Mrs. Myers were chaperoning a Miss Diedrich who was with us most of the time. She wore a very sensible outing suit with a short skirt, as did Mrs. Myers. The five of us young girls naturally attracted a good deal of attention from the various young men stationed in the park in various capacities. Soldiers at Fort Yellowstone, clerks at the hotels, guides at various stops, and even some members of the party traveling with us. McKistry Burt from Detroit was among the latter and very nice to us all. We called him the brotherly young man. The nicest evening was at the Fountain Hotel because army officers, guides, and clerks often came from other places to dance. And these young men were very nice to us and we were probably a bright spot in their humdrum life. Um, when I started this, I didn't know that, there, that dancing at the hotels was routine, but it, it was in this period uh, around 1900. They would clear out the dining rooms in the hotels. Uh, there were bands who would come in. Of course, there was no recorded music at that time. Uh, often the bands were, were composed of soldiers who were patrolling the, the park at that point, and they would have dances. Uh, and people would sneak in from the campgrounds nearby and join the dances. Uh, sounds to me like it would have been great fun. Of course, while people were uh, taking these kinds of tours, people continued to come with their, their horses and buggies, their horses and wagons, uh, and visit the park. Um, one group of them were people who um, brought their own teams, wagons, did their own cooking, put up their own tents. They weren't like Georgina Singe with a whole crew to help them. They were um, all by themselves. They were referred to as sage rushers. Um, and that, that name came from the fact that the good camping sites were often uh, already taken and they were forced to go out and camp in the sagebrush flats. So these are people like my ancestors, my grandmother, as Rachel mentioned, used to tell me stories of her trip to the park in 1909, and they went as, sa as sage brushers. Um, and maybe my favorite story inside Saddles and Geysers is, is the one by Eleanor Corthell. Eleanor Corthell lived in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and one day she came home and told her husband to expect a bill that she'd bought a horse and wagon and that she was taking their seven children to Yellowstone Park. Uh, those of you familiar with geography know that Cheyenne is in the southeast corner of Wyoming and the Yellowstone Park in the northeast corner. So the first thing she had to do was, was cross the entire state of Wyoming. Uh, and that's quite a challenge in itself. Uh, her husband, Dallas Gorthel, was a man after my own heart. Um, he sent Eleanor and the kids uh, across Wyoming by wagon all by themselves. Uh, and then uh, he got on the train and joined them there. So it's, um, you know, my kind of guy. Uh, let me read you just a snippet from, from one of uh, Eleanor's uh, descriptions. I, I had a tough time choosing which one because the other one I really enjoyed was her, her discussion of uh, sitting by the paint pots and trying to watch all seven of her children and hoping none of them fell in. And one of her children 
her youngest son saying we didn't come all the way across Wyoming to fall in the mud. So um, that was that's a good one too. But I'm going to read uh, what Eleanor wrote one afternoon after she uh, spent the day at the uh, falls of the Yellowstone and the canyon. It would seem sacrilege to return to camp after that glorious gaze into nature's proudest wonderland and go baking beans. Yet we had to have a change from camp, Van Camps. I wouldn't speak of it now, only that is how we came to have a visit from a bear. The beans were not done at bedtime, so I put on fine knot, pine knots, thinking they would be just right for breakfast. It was so, so hot, the stove had to be outside. About midnight, there was a great clatter of falling stove. And sure enough, a bear had tipped it over to get my beans. He was trying so hard to work the combination of the oven door that he never noticed our excitement. Not until the combination of the door, no, not until he, I threw things at him, would he go away. On the whole, I presume, I would have been very disappointed if one bear at least had not paid us a visit. We never thought of being afraid, and I used all my ingenuity in hiding the bacon and sugar from prowling bears every night. Another thing that hasn't changed in the park is if you camp in the park, you'd better hide out your what bacon and sugar, as, as um, Eleanor says. That's the stuff that I prepared for you tonight. Um, I hope that gives you a, a sense of the different kinds of people uh, whose stories are included in side saddles and geysers. That is from a six-year-old girl to a um, a matron uh, with her seven children. There are also stories of women traveling with their husbands. There are stories of women traveling alone. Uh, so there's a whole, whole variety there. And then it, you get a good sense also of the changes in the park from uh, the early 1870s when it's a roadless wilderness to that time when it's uh, been Disney for Maybe it turned into a Walt Disney Resort. Um, with that, I think I'll pause and answer any questions or listen to any comments you may have about Side Saddles and Geysers or my other books or any other thing you want to talk about. Don't everybody talk at once. No questions? Hey, Mark, it's you, might you might remind people to turn their microphones on if they want to talk. Thank you, David. David says, if you want to talk, turn on your microphone. And that would be a good idea because I would like to hear your questions. Uh, I, ha I have a question. This is Sarah. And uh, you may have talked about it at the beginning, uh, but... Where did you find all of this information? That's a question that comes up and there's a, you know, kind of everywhere. Uh, as you know, Sarah, my wife worked at the uh, Montana State University Library. Yes. And Special Collections there has a, has a collection. When I came back to Montana in 2003, I was looking for something to do. And I remembered my grandmother's stories and my wife said, well, why don't you go look at this, look at the uh, collection up at MSU? So I did. Uh, so that's one place. And there's a good collection there. There's another pretty good cl collection at your Gallatin History Museum. Smile, Rachel. Uh, there we go. Um, there's another collection at, at uh, the Montana History Society. A lot of these things are available at the... Um, at the Yellowstone Park Research Center in Gardner. Uh, mm -hmm. I stopped at little museums around the state. I love visiting lo little county museums. You see all sorts of interesting things there and always ask if they had any. So I found some wow. here and there. Uh, and I mined the web. 
So most of the stuff I've got was published one way or another. Um, some of it wasn't. Alice Richards, for example, was not published, uh, although it was featured in a display up at our Montana State University Library. Did you see that, Sarah, when it was up there in Special Collections? Uh, uh, what was in Special Collections? I missed that. I'm sorry. Alice Richards' story and, and some photos. Oh, no, I, I did miss that. Hmm. Other questions? Again. Okay. I can't hey, hear Marcus you. Joe Brookman. Yeah. So I love your book, and it reminds me of when I read like 40 years ago. But in Rocky Mountain National Park, have you looked at women's adventures in other parks, or have you heard of Isabella Bird? Uh, I have heard of Isabella Bird, and I've read some of her stuff. Um, Isabella did not visit Yellowstone Park, and I have not looked for women visiting other parks. Uh, but, you know, maybe maybe I should do that, because I'm running out of ideas for, for new books. So maybe, uh, you know, I did look at books uh, about Glacier National Park and found no books. So if there were people visiting there, uh, maybe there's room for a book. Uh, Isabella Bird is, is great fun. I mean, at the, uh, but I would is, uh, is, is recommend you read a brief Georgiana the... Singe. Yes. Was Isabella the most recognized or famous of all the national park visitors who were women at that time? Probably. Yeah, her description of climbing Long's Peak with Mountain Man Jim, and there's still a Jim's Grove campsite where they had spent the night. And I've, I've been up Long's Peak a half a dozen times, but reading reading her description of that was just, um, it was more vivid than seeing a motion picture, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what you've brought to Yellowstone. And um, uh, it's just terrific. And maybe you'll do it for Glacier now. Uh, yeah, I would comment that the, you know, I chose the stories in Side Saddles and Geysers because I thought they were well-written, interesting, they told good adventure stories. They still told stories with humor. I kind of missed presenting the adventure stories tonight. Uh, I have presented Anna Cowan's story of being captured by the Nez Perce in 1877 so many times that I figured that a number of you had probably heard that. Uh, but that's Inside Saddles and Geysers. Another adventure story there is, is by a woman named Carrie Strayhorn who was caught in a blizzard when she visited the park and canyon. Uh, she was touring on horseback, so she had to ride back to the, from the canyon to uh, the lower geyser basin in a storm. So that's another exciting story. Uh, more questions. Mark? Mark? Yes. Uh, yeah, hi. This, these were the Lancasters. We're down in Tulsa, Oklahoma, listening, and we came in after you had started. So I wanted to know if you had uh, referenced at all the book Six Weeks on Horseback Through Yellowstone Park by Louise Elliott, published by the Rapid City Journal in 1913. I'm familiar with it. It's another delightful book. Um... And no, I didn't include it in this book. I was a little reluctant to do that because it's a fictionalized account. And, and I didn't want to write a long, long uh, introduction apologizing for it. But it's, you know, and she tells it, she admits that she's, you know, uh, created some characters and done some things in there. But she also says that she has, um, accurately portrayed a visit to the park. And that's another interesting example. She was a, a, a woman who hired on as a cook to go through the park. And there are some really delightful stories in there. Uh, well, what I thought was interesting, we've been collecting Yellowstone for Yellowstone memorabilia for 30 years. And uh, we're very glad to get this book. It's very hard to find, but she had such an interesting uh, write-up about the Canyon Hotel. 
And it was in a different way than I've read in other books. And I think that as far as the highlight of her book for me, it was her um, interpretation and uh, of the, the old Canyon Hotel. Yeah, that's nice. My favorite part of that book is the story she tells. Uh, she, she talks about a snobby lady from Boston. Oh, yes. Who yes. was bragging about everything. And then her uh, fellow cook, I guess, who's, you know, decided to get even and uh, undoes the lady from Boston's uh, wonderful mattress. pneumatic yeah. sleeping mattress, yeah. air mattress. And yeah. it's just a hilarious account. So that's my favorite bit of that book. Yeah, yeah. Enjoyed your, your talk today and it's great to be able to zoom in and participate from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Ah, yeah, Joe was is somewhere down in the middle of Utah. So we've had any, anybody from the uh, Eastern third of the country out there with a question. Alyssa, got a question? So uh, this is Sarah uh, from Team Guapiqua, uh, and Alyssa, our wonderful marketing manager who's helped with this book, is also on, uh, attending the call this evening. Um, Mark, I was curious, um, what, what do you think it is that sets the stories that these young women tell about their experiences in the park? What sets that apart from maybe these stories that young men would tell? Like, what is different about, what made you want to write about the women specifically? I was tired of writing about men. Uh, I guess that's kind of a flippant answer, but it's also true. Uh, I thought the, the stories of women had been neglected. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, all sorts of stories out there about Jim Bridger and about um, Langford and, you know, just all sorts of people, uh, the explorers and the mountain men and other folks, uh, and not much uh, about women. Um, women in Wonderland by Elizabeth Watry is, is a wonderful book, but it, it's mostly about people who had careers in Yellowstone Park one way or another. They were rangers or people who worked at hotels or things like that. So it's a very different book than mine, but it's, it's a good one. I, so women haven't been totally neglected. Uh, but I thought they had, there was a bunch of good stories here, a, a good theme. And, and frankly, I thought there'd be a good market. I think uh, people out there will enjoy these stories and will buy my book. Sounds like it was a good place to go to find a husband is what I'm hearing. Lots of soldiers, lots of rangers. If you were a single lady, it's just a good place to go and, and get yourself a husband. Hmm. <laughs> I don't have any of those stories other than, other than Ann Richards, who I don't think was in the husband hunting business at that moment, but uh, it might have been. I, 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 can, I can see that. Other questions? We're going to run this until our 45 minutes runs out. Is that right, Rachel? So if, if we just disappear on you, uh, you'll know that we just ran out, of, ran out ran to our limit. Other questions? I was uh, wondering about Lord and Lady Blackmore. Um, she died when they were going through. Were they going toward Yellowstone or do you know? Yes, they were headed toward Yellowstone. That would have been, I believe, 1871. So it's actually before the park. Um, Lord Blackmore was invited to go with the um, expedition that was was commissioned by the government to do a formal exploration there, the, the Hayden expedition. Uh, he had gone to um, Crow Agency, we went over there and he left his wife in Bozeman and Lady Blackmore died. Uh, he did finally proceed to join the Hayden expedition after he attended to the, those things. And as you probably know, Lady Moore, Blackmore is buried in the Bozeman Cemetery uh, with that strange pyramid-shaped uh, tombstone. Uh, but yes, and I, I don't think there was any plan for Lady Blackmore to go through the park at that point. That would have been an interesting thing had it occurred. There were no women on the Hayden expedition that I know of.
Gus no, but, that I read about um, a lady homesteader, and I don't think she actually uh, talks about Yellowstone, but you were talking about women who uh, wrote about their experiences out there, and it's uh, Letters of a Woman Homesteader, and uh, the lady's, lady's name is Eleanor Pruitt Stewart. And uh, very interesting book, if you're interested in the topic of women out on the, the prairie. Yeah, I have heard of that book. Uh, where are you? Uh, Winderoth? Yeah, we're in uh, Connecticut, Mystic, Connecticut. I think, I think you're winning the uh, distance award tonight. <laughs> uh, anybody further? Okay, we're... We're going to give it then. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know what the award is, but you have it. <laughs> Thank you. Glad to be here. Any more questions? How are we fixed for time, Rachel? I'll make a comment. Okay. <laughs> the comment is, this is sure a relief and a hell of a lot of fun from and vacation from Co thinking about COVID and politics. And I said, no, I'm not going to watch the news tonight. This I'm going to do something more fun. Eleanor Pruitt, there was a film, a movie made, Heartland, I believe it's called, about uh, Eleanor Pruitt and her uh, struggles and victories as a homesteader in, in Wyoming, tough times. And well, she uh, became the, the wife of a Scottish um, rancher, mm -hmm. basically, and um, yeah, and they go through a hor horrific winter, but they make it through, and at the very end, uh, they are helping a, a mama cow to have a calf, and you know that things are looking up, and the grass is getting green again. Um, I'll just, my other comment is, it's interesting how there were no women obviously on the Hayden project, nor were there any women indeed in the U.S. Geological Survey until there were. And now I'm thinking of Mary Marr, who studied bison in the Lamar Valley, and um, Kathy Whitlock, of course, um, our a professor at Montana State, who's um, pretty renowned for her work. Um, so it's it's kind of neat to think of women be becoming prominent scientists in the park these days. Yeah, it was a different world. One of the things you'll, you may notice if you read Side Saddles and Geysers is the hints about women, their, their attitudes. Uh, that is, you notice that, you know, Alice Richards really thought she should have a, have a chaperone and one wondered about canceling the trip because of that. Uh, Eleanor Corthell, as soon as her husband showed up, boy, he was the boss then. And she had just spent her, her time, you know, going corner to corner across Wyoming and managing everything. And all of a sudden, you know, he's the boss and he immediately screws up. It'd be, it's, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, and he, she doesn't comment on that at all, but it's, and I guess that's telling in, in itself that, um, and you get other other kinds of senses of the changing role of women, and of course Georgina Singe strikes me as a liberated woman by woman by anybody's standards. She's she does what she wants. She goes to the park with her husband, and she just refers to him as A, and um, you know she appears to like him, and you know she doesn't say a lot about him. Uh, so. That's one of the fun things to look for is, you know, that 30 years in there was women's roles were starting to change. They changed more radically in the early 20th century. Other comments or questions? Mark, Sandra, Oldendorf. Hi, Sandra. Hi. Well, I did want to comment how wonderful it is to see people's faces for, <laughs> you know, I've been looking at masks for the last seven months. <laughs> Um, you, you probably know this book. I, it's um, called Eight Women, Two Model Tees in the American West. I bought mm -hmm. it at the uni at, uh, Museum of the Rockies bookstore. But when you started down the road, excuse the pun, 
of talking about women being liberated. These are eight women in 1924 and they're Model T's and and they're in their 20s and they take off and they go west and there's all kinds of comments you know one of their parents thinks that you know they'll die they'll never come back and uh, a granddaughter of one of the women started to collect the stories about what happened to them and lots of stories of mud and cars breaking down and uh, uh, lots of fun things so they do go through Yellowstone they go through Montana they're in Billings they're in Bozeman so relevant to what you're talking about in that way as well. Yeah. Um, I know of that book, I confess, I've not read it yet. Uh, and I've kind of quit my research um, in 1923. Um, by then, and the, I've, I've thought that maybe I should do research on the Model T era in the park. I've got, should look for those stories because, you know, they had, there were, there was some different kind of fun as you pushed your Model T backwards, uh, you had to put it in reverse because of the way the gas gas tank worked on a Model T, uh, you could get stuck in the mud. Uh, I think there must be good adventures there, uh, but I haven't gone that far in it. Uh, you know, I've stayed busy with, with, with uh, staying in the era of horses and, and not, not not looking much for stories of people with cars. I've, I've got a few and I could move forward. A lot of, a lot of stories of people in, taking the grand tour in a, in a, in a big touring car. Uh, I haven't found Model T's other than the book you mentioned is the, is one place. Sandra, would you repeat the name of the book you mentioned? She'll hold it up. Put it, well, if, I don't know. It's, it's, Eight women, two Model Ts, and the author, and the, and the American West, and it's published by University of Nebraska Press. Thank you. How to keep this rolling, folks? Um. My grandparents uh, lived in Bozeman in 1890s on to about 1930. And there was a story about them going to Yellowstone from Bozeman in a stagecoach or some kind of horse drawn something or other. Uh, do you have any idea what route they would have taken? Because of course the modern roads weren't there or, or at that time. It was about 1900. Uh, I don't specifically know about 1900. In 1874 was when, when stagecoaches began there. And another of the stories in my book is a woman, woman who tells about that stagecoach ride from Bozeman. I believe they, they went over, um, Trail Creek Pass, so you'd go a few miles east of Bozeman up the canyon and then turn south. Uh, you'd come down Trail Creek, uh, and if you've been through the Paradise Valley, that road comes out about a, about across the valley from Chico Hot Springs, a little north of there, uh, and then they would turn into the park, is, is what I think that route was, uh, whether that continued uh, how long that continued, I don't know. The road from Livingston, of course, is relatively new. Livingston is a town, a creation of the railroad, which got there in uh, 1883. Uh, when the railroad got, got to Livingston, uh, the first thing they did was start building a, a spur line to, uh, to the park. That is one of the, one of the impetuses for creating the park. Uh, was that they thought there would be uh, a, a railroad traffic for tourism. The railroads were lobbying for the park. I just noticed that we have both David and Bonnie Andes here. Give, wave, give us a wave, Bonnie. There we go. Uh, do you have a question? Man, you're no fun. But it is good to see your face. Anybody else? 
I've got a uh, I've got a quick question for you, Mark. Um, and but and I know we've mentioned it before, but I mean, I still contend that um, Emma, the the Raidersburg party is is like one of the greatest camping trip stories, uh, you know, in Yellowstone. And it was great. I loved the I loved encounters in Yellowstone and and bringing you know bringing Say that, that again. What pardon? Say say that again. <laughs> I loved, I loved, I loved, uh, you know, after hearing snippets of the Raidersburg party to finally uh, bring it in, bring it to book length. It was, it was really, uh, it's really a great story. I've, I've always enjoyed that. Um, a couple of things. One is, uh, and I, and I, you know, one of the, one of the Carpenter brothers that didn't make the trip, Willie Carpenter. Um, I know some of his descendants, but anyway, uh, if anybody if anybody is ever out in Logan and, uh, you know, goes to Headwater State Park, Car Carpenter Road dissects from the frontage road out to Headwater State Park. And that, that was named after Willie Carpenter because he, or, and we, uh, we always knew him as William Carpenter because he had that land out there. Um, one of the questions I had though was, and I've seen it in other references too, and I think it's the Butler Brothers Ranch near Emigrant. Um, do you know about where that was because that played a role uh and it's played a role in a few things because of you know as a uh you know sort of that sort of that vestige of civilization in an early yellowstone yeah the the Butler brothers ranch was was directly across the valley from um from do we have to push from the immigrant canyon the story there fred Butler came to there, I think, I think in 1865 or so, I don't remember the exact year, uh, he decided to settle because, I don't know, because guys did that. Uh, so he came down Trail Creek, which is, a, which is a little north of there, and he looked across the river, which was at that time the Crow Reservation. He saw a bunch of um, young Crow men riding around doing maneuvers. So he moved on up, uh, the valley to across from from immigrants so he had the protection of the miners uh, he also had uh, a ready uh, store for selling the stuff because you know by the next year he, he had a vegetable garden and milk cows and he set up a water wheel to churn butter uh, Fred Botler guided several trips he was he was with uh, Norris who tried to go into the park in 1870 uh, he guided the Earl of Dunraven. He was with the Hayden Expedition. So Fred Butler, uh, I don't know that there's enough information, but if you know, maybe I'll write a novel about Fred Butler because he, he was fun. Um, and um, Willie Carpenter, one of the you know Emma Carpenter talks mentions him in 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 hers, you know, waving his handkerchief as they went away. He must have been a few years younger. Um, yeah. And probably kept on the ranch to, to do ranch work while the uh, others did. Yeah. There was a, there was um, there was an older brother who lived in Helena at that time, as well as Frank, the next brother, um, who went to the park uh, in there. And you know, I want to emphasize that you know that story is told in Encounters in Yellowstone. Uh, that's an, an award-winning book. I'm really proud of that. And so yeah. that's why I wanted Paul to say, I love Rivers <laughs> in Yellowstone. But he didn't figure that out. So can you say it now? Encounters in Yellowstone, summer of 1877. You know, it's a... It was great to great to uh, uh, you know ha had you because you had mentioned it I think in some of your other works, and then it sounds like there's a, there's a reference to it in your new book as well, which I look forward to reading. Yeah, I've got I've got always... Emma's version is in there. That is the 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 new book really is in 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 their own words. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and Willie Willie was Willie was the was the brother just older than the youngest sister that was on. I wasn't sure. And I'm trying to think of remember what her name was, but um, but anyway, that's quite a quite a story. And I've I've gotten a little bit more information on the Carpenter family, but uh, anyway, that's that's still one of my favorite favorite stories. Her name was Ida. Ida, uh, and she was 13 when she took that trip. Uh, and in uh, Ida has a very short story about about the capture itself. 
in one of the versions of Frank's book that's that's kind of interesting. Uh, Thank you. You might want to remind people who aren't talking to turn their microphones off because it sometimes overrides you or anybody else who's talking. I'll turn mine off now. Thank you, David. I did find um, there's another book out that was called To Yellowstone Park and Back. And it's three young women who left Madison in 1929 and drove to Yellowstone and back again. And it's based on the one of the women's scrapbook and her, I think, niece put it together and, and it was published. So it's called To Yellowstone Park and Back. Okay. Uh, I'm not familiar with that. From Madison, Wisconsin? Um, yes. I think so. Yes. Yeah. That's, a, that's a pretty good trip. Where are you? Uh, we're in Carlsbad, California. Okay. We're not well represented east of the Mississippi. Come on, we need more. <laughs> Thank you. Question. Mark, you've done a lot of research, obviously, on, on various trips to Yellowstone. So in, in doing your research for this book, what did you find the most interesting uh, you know, in terms of what women were writing about their trips compared to what men were writing, um, you know, what was the, the unique perspective that these women brought to trips to the Yellowstone Park? Uh, that's a good question. And I, I haven't really thought a lot about it. Um, of course, a lot of the men's trips are, are much earlier and are high adventure. Uh, so there's, there's that difference. You know, we don't have the women don't do much wrestling bears or uh, those kinds of things that, are, that some of the men's stories have. I think I, I, I have men's stories from the same era, that is 1872 onward, and I'm not finding a lot of differences. Uh, you know, there's certainly Emma Cowan's concern for her children. Uh, that's a different kind of, kind of thing. Uh, but I'm not sure that a, a, a man who traveled with seven children wouldn't be equally concerned that they weren't going to fall into uh, mud pots or get it and eaten by bears or the various things that Emma worries about. So I don't know. So you, you, do you think that they essentially had, I, maybe let me ask this, if, if they had the same experiences, do you think it was then riskier for those women to be willing to go there at all? Riskier. That's a fun, fun question too, uh, Matthew. Um, you know, I don't think most of these people thought of themselves as taking ri risks. The people, even including uh, people like the six-year-old girl who were going to the park, you know, for them, these these kinds of things were what they did. That's how you got to Montana was on was in a, in a wagon or, or on horseback. They were used to that kind of thing. So I don't think they they felt particularly apprehensive about those things. Uh, they knew Indians did not frequent that area very much. Uh, it's a myth that the, that the Indians wouldn't go at all, but that was it there. Uh, I have thought about um, the woman who travels with her seven children, and I, I think that would be comparable to somebody coming home, a woman coming home today and telling your husband, you know, expect a bill. I bought a Winnebago, and I'm taking the kids to the park. That is, in a sense, it's a brave thing to do, but it's not, a, you know, it's not anything that would, um, would flabbergast us. It would be just something that this would be a, a, a remarkable thing to have happen. Uh, I think for most of these women, you know, they don't sense danger, although there was some danger from, from being in the park. Uh, you certainly could, could fall through a thin crust, a whole bunch of things like that if you weren't careful. You may have noticed that uh, you could chase away the bears, and I have a number of accounts of, of people uh, camped out and, and chasing away the bears. One of the best jobs, you know, it's another one of those things that I thought about trying to write a, a, a 
a young adult book or a, a mid grades book about a, about a boy who gets a job at, at one of the permanent camps. The, these are places that had um, tents set up in the spring. They had they had wooden floors. They had stoves. They they were attended uh, the so called Wiley Way, named after William Wallace Wiley, who, who invented this kind of thing. At any rate, one of the jobs you could have at the Wiley Way camp was you had, you had two duties. You had to milk the cows uh, and, and at night when, when things were dark, you had to chase away the bears. That was, that was part of the job. Uh, and you know, they had dogs and they'd throw rocks and the bears would go away. Huh? The other thing you, that you might have as a duty, and this is why it would make a great fun book, is to catch fish for the guests. So your job was to catch 40 or 50 fish, uh, which apparently wasn't that hard to do in that era. Uh, so that, that'd be, a, I may be talking myself into writing such a book. I, I, I wish I had a better, better answer for you, Matthew. And it's good to see what you look like in, in uh, real oh, estate. We, we have met virtually before. Matthew, tell folks about your book. Oh, uh, a book coming out in April uh, about uh, a guy named Texas Jack Omahundro, who was actually on the, uh, he went into uh, Yellowstone, I guess, twice, uh, at least twice, uh, maybe more times, but two documented times. The first in uh, 1874 with the uh, Earl of Dunraven. Uh, and then in, uh, you know, he's in your book as well. Uh, he was there when, uh, with the Nez Perce, uh, and the Cowans, the Raidersburg party. Uh, but my, my book, which gets to some of that, is more about uh, the fact that he was kind of the first uh, cowboy to rise to prominence in America. And because he was the first cowboy to rise to prominence, kind of set the uh, some of the foundations for the cowboy mythos in America. He was one of the first people to write about cowboys. To He was the first guy to do a lasso act on the American stage. And he was Buffalo Bill's earliest stage partner and best friend. Um, so yeah, that's that's mine. But uh, I learned a lot about uh, the context for his trip from from your encounters book, which was you know just great. I'll echo what Paul said. Ah, uh, there's Sarah Park. Sarah, ask me a question. Another person I've never never met in in wet space, but I. We, we were acquaintances. I mean, I, I asked you a question about uh, why the women's stories, um, but I'm also curious to know, um, did you have a favorite character who you read about in your research who maybe wasn't a good fit for this book, but maybe we can look forward to seeing something about them in the future? Hmm. There are good people I left out and you know, I've been focused on who I put in, Sarah, so I don't really have any, nothing leaps to mind. I've got a good story that's a little later of a woman traveling through uh, in one of the touring cars. Uh, her name slips me at the moment, but that uh, that Model T era uh, is great. Uh, and there was, you know, there's some redundancy in the stories. Um, that is, there's just stories that are left out because not because they're bad stories, but because th I thought I had a better fit to get the range of stories I wanted in this book. Uh, I'll probably have that adventure of straightening out my files again, and, and, and I'll see what I can find. But it's good to meet you, Sarah, if, if not in wet space, in cyberspace. There have been some wonderful book recommendations on here, too. I'm taking notes of all the books that people recommend, so thank you for that. Let's see, you're in Helena, right? No, I am also in Connecticut, uh, but I'm in Meriden, Connecticut. Okay. Yes. Hi. If, if there's nobody else, uh, Rachel's going to shut us down. Johanna, what have you got? You've got to turn on your mic. You're muted. You're muted. You 
can go ahead, Marlene, if you had one. Well, thanks. Thank you. Yes, uh, I had gone to look for my book about two women that drove to Yellowstone in a Model T or Model A from Michigan. And I think it's the same book the other lady held up, but they drove from Michigan. And um, I couldn't find my copy. Uh, but uh, anyway, I just wanted to, admit, I had gone to look for, I'm from Battle Creek, Michigan originally, but I'm li I live here in Montana now. But uh, someone had uh, brought that book to my attention and I got it and read it. And I thought I knew where it was. <laughs> Hi, this is Diane from California, and um, I don't have a book recommendation, but all this is making me think of um, my mother's story in Yellowstone, but it was in the 1930s. Uh, she, I don't know what kind of car she came in from North Dakota. Her brothers dropped her off, and she spent the summer as a bubble queen. And bubble queens did the laundry as opposed to the biffy queens, which cleaned the outhouses. So if, if you look for your, if your car story, maybe you can piggyback that with, you know, summer help. Mm -hmm. That, that was the book. Um, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It was uh, Northern Michigan when they traveled to Yellowstone. Okay, still a long trip. Can you show that book again one more time so we can see the title? It's called To Yellowstone. And right. it's, by, it's a journal July 20th to August 12th, 1929 by Irene Angus. Great. That is the book that I just put into the chat. I just grabbed it from Amazon used books. You can obviously get it from other places too, but that was to get the bibliographic information. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Marianne. Um, in the beginning, you talked about, of course, there were women in Yellowstone for a very, very long time before the white settlement. And I know it's very hard to find stories of native or indigenous women, but have you run across any? I know that I think the state of Montana Historical Society might have a few just about things in Montana, but have you run across any? Um, no, I haven't. I have not run, a, run across any stories by Native Americans. I've not done the obvious kind of things like, like go to the Crow Reservation and ask. Uh, but in the kind of routine going through archives and stuff like that, I've not seen a, seen a single story from the point of view of Native Americans. I guess with the exception of Yellow Wolf, who was with the Nez Perce when they went through, if you count that. Uh, but that's really a story of, of that conflict. It's not a story about visiting the park. Uh, so that's a little different kind of thing. I, I think that's kind of a conspicuous, strange thing. There, I think there. <laughs> well, if you can find them, I think I think there's a marketable book there, uh, but I haven't seen them. Uh, and it, it would really be exciting to if we if we had a good set of accounts of what that was like. Now the um, the Sheep Eater Indians, uh, band of the Shoshone lived in Yellowstone Park uh, in there. And there are stories of encounters with them, uh, people who met with the, who, who encountered them. They were a fairly shy, peaceful people. Uh, they didn't want to mess with pe anybody. And when the, when the park was made a park, they went over and joined the uh, other bands of the Shoshone and went on the, on the, uh, reservation in Wyoming. So, you know, there used to be a question of what happened to the sheep eaters? Where did they disappear? You know, and people would scratch their heads and wonder where the sheep eaters went. And they finally went and asked the other Shoshone and they said, oh, Joe over there, he was a sheep eater. And you know, they just, it's really another funny little incident that, you know, you know the Shoshone were Shoshone and they were happy to have these other people join them when they got their reservation. 
Thank you. I'm scanning. Anybody else try and hit your button and give me a question. Susan Backer, are you there? Apparently not. I moved out a nice picture of her bookcase or something. Uh, there she is. <laughs> there she goes. Here she is. Got a question, Susan? I'm not sure I have a question, Mark, but um, I just have to say how much I appreciate all of the scholarly work that you put into this. Uh, Mark and I have been in a writer's group for many years together, and I've heard many of these stories, and it's been so illuminating to hear others' comments about how all of this history has come together in in your story. So um, great appreciation for what you've done, Mark. Thank you. I didn't I deny being scholarly, if you know, uh, our friend Paul Wiley on, on one of these windows, he's scholarly. I have, I just try to have fun. Well, I'm glad you have. It's enriching all of us. Mark, not scholarly, just devoted to endless work. <laughs> Which I'm sure you understand. I do. But, but Paul, I uses, you understand. Paul uses more footnotes than I do, so that makes him <laughs> yeah. uh, more scholarly. <laughs> it, it looks scholarly, let's say it that way. <laughs> oh, this has been fun. Mark, thanks so much for doing this tonight. I really appreciate it. Okay. I, uh, yeah, I think this has been a success. I think we can talk Rachel into, into sponsoring more events like this. Um, this seems to have worked well. I think it's been great that we've had people from Connecticut and California and mm -hmm. Texas and all around. Uh, it's, it's, you know, something the museum, I don't believe has, has done before, uh, to, to have this kind of contact. And uh, if we were doing an in-person event, we would have uh, a bunch of people from Bozeman and, and the surrounding area sh sh show up. And that's great. Uh, but this, this opens a new avenue for us. Uh, and I think that's, that's great. I would say that, you know, it's really been fun to do this. I, you know, the only thing that I would uh, enjoy talking about better more is is my grandchildren and uh, I'm looking at Arlene Wiley when I say that she's always bragging on her grandchildren uh, and they're fine grandchildren I, I enjoy them uh, but, it's only uh, one Mark just her grandchild all that bragging on just one of them one got, grand, it's my granddaughter and I, I've prayed for a long time to get her I've got two grandchildren Arlene I got you beat uh, yeah <laughs> I've been I've been laying hints all over the place, but so far no takers, <laughs> either boys. <laughs> okay, I think Rachel, it's it's your turn to take over and make any concluding comments. Yeah, well, I just want to thank everyone for showing up. We had a great crowd tonight. It ended up being about fifty six people, so it was really wonderful to see everyone. And we'll try and work on doing more of these. So thank you all so much for coming. Thanks for doing it, Rachel. Yeah, nice to see everyone. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.